consider the structure of the DNA double helix in the context of the genes arrayed along the DNA and how the DNA is organized into chromatin and when the cell is dividing into chromosomes. We'll look at the basis for the organization of DNA and chromatin, the association of different proteins with the DNA. We'll look at the karyotype of chromosomes and we'll take a look at how genes are actually arrayed along chromosomes. We'll take a brief look at how the chemical modification of chromatin proteins causes the chromatin to change conformation. Chemically, chromosomes and chromatin are made up of DNA and different proteins. Chromosomes are highly condensed forms of chromatin. Chromatin then is a less condensed association of DNA with in fact fewer proteins. So what is a chromosome? Here's a crude drawing of one. You may recognize some of the features or at least where some of the features ought to be. We refer to the ends of the chromosomes as their telomeres and each chromosome typically has two telomeres. There is a central constriction in many or most chromosomes, a centromere. Among the components of chromosomes are the sequences in the DNA and of course the sequences in DNA include genes which we typically think of as sequences of DNA that code for proteins and you may also recall the term transposons or mobile elements which are scattered throughout the genome. In fact in many higher organisms mobile elements make up a goodly portion of the genome. You may also recognize origins of replication sequences at which DNA begins to duplicate itself. So there are different kinds of genetic information within a chromosome. Chromosomes evolved to ensure correct separation of the duplicated genetic information produced during the S phase in the life of a cell and is going to be partitioned during mitosis or during cell division. The information for a chromosome to behave appropriately during mitosis or for that matter during meiosis must lie on the chromosome itself. In fact it must be some kind of genetic information, right? So what is this information? Here's a description in brief of a really fun experiment engineering a minimal yeast chromosome. Here we have cartooned one of a yeast cell's normal chromosomes showing several components. I've used a kind of orange color to be the origins of replication. The ends are the telomeres, I've colored them blue, and in the middle I've made a centromere in black. You may recall that telomeres are in fact specific sequences found only at the ends of chromosomes enabling them to replicate properly. We will cover these features in more detail when we discuss replication, but for the moment I'd like you to remember that there are these components of any typical chromosome. In a genetic engineering laboratory, a yeast chromosome was engineered to remove most of its genes. In fact, also some of its origins of replication, leaving behind what was termed a yeast artificial chromosome, endearingly called a yak. It has two telomeres, it has only one origin of replication and it has a centromere. You can take this chromosome and put it back into yeast cells. The yaks are recognized in that cell and replicated, that is duplicated, and partitioned just like a normal chromosome. So to summarize, the conclusion from this experiment is that the minimal genetic information required to make a chromosome is that this structure has centromeric DNA sequences, telomeric DNA sequences, and at least one origin of replication. Let's take a brief look at some ways of staining chromosomes. One we'll look at enhances the specificity of karyotyping, which is the art of uniquely identifying chromosomes in cells. Cell karyotypes can even be used to distinguish closely related organisms. The other form of staining, which we'll look at in a moment, emphasizes the changes in chromatin during the transition between interphase to the phases of mitosis. An organism's chromosomes often have unique shapes, that's hinted at in this illustration, and these shapes allow us to identify the chromosomes and number them, as you see here, and again, even identify different organisms by virtue of the different shapes. But what you're looking at here is G-staining, staining with a stain called Gimsa, which along with Q-banding are stains that recognize AT-rich regions of DNA, that is DNA sequences rich in the bases A and T along a chromosome. This means of course that the banding is not related to the loci of genes, to the location of genes on the chromosome, but rather to that physical difference between being AT-rich or GC-rich. Again, these specific stains define individual chromosomes even further, refining a karyotype. 
This is the other kind of staining I mentioned. In this case, the fluorescent stain is called DAPI, D-A-P-I, and it also recognizes AT-rich DNA, like the GIMSA stain that we just saw in G-banding. When applied to living, dividing, and non-dividing cells, as shown here, it's clear from the localization and the concentration of fluorescence that chromatin must be undergoing major changes in the transition between interphase and, in this case, anaphase of mitosis. Finally, let's look at a map of genes on chromosome 2 of Drosophila. Drosophila gene mapping has been known for some time and had been done, as we say, genetically for many years. But with the advent of DNA sequencing and genome projects, including the Genome Project of Drosophila, we can directly determine the locus of genes, the order of genes on a chromosome. Here are the loci of the genes on chromosome 2. The colors above and below the lines are genes encoded on opposite strands of the double helix. The actual colors represent genes homologous to those in other species, including species ranging from humans to worms. A big take-home message here is that we all, that is to say all species, share a lot of genes and genome similarity, reinforcing our common ancestry 